Henry Yu. I'm the principal here at St. John's College. I welcome you all uh, to our uh, beautiful dining hall um, for the Grant Ingram Distinguished Speaker Series and UBC Reed Sustainability Event. So we're partnering up. Um, and just to let you know, for, how many of you have never been in St. John's College before? Okay, uh, a large enough percentage. To, I, I'll just explain that uh, what St. John's is. St. John's uh, is an international um, uh, community. It's got graduate students from 45 different countries who live here, um, and they dine together exactly where you are eating. We have our, our own chef and dining society, and so I uh, hope you're enjoying uh, the salmon. Um, if you see a flag up around you, someone from that place uh, has lived here or is living here. Uh, so they're not all United Nations flags. Uh, behind me is uh, the flag of Musqueam. Uh, there are other flags that are not recognized nations, but who, if, a, if a resident feels that he, he or she wants a certain flag, then that's the one we put up. Um, just to explain the boats overhead, that's a, an, an art project uh, um, overseen by our, one of our faculty fellows, Gu Shong from Fine Arts, and it represents uh, Johannian Journeys. Uh, St. John's alumni are, uh, of the original St. John's University in Shanghai, who are our founders. It was sort of the Harvard of China, the leading university in China, uh, but it was shut down in 1952, and the alumni of that university founded this college. And so uh, our residents, our faculty fellows, our, our, uh, all those associated with our community uh, hand-folded those and they represent, again, uh, the journeys uh, which all of us are on in life. Um, I'm going to now, as we often do, we're very lucky to have as one of our fellows, uh, Elder Larry Grant uh, of the House of Learning and also of, of um, Musqueam. And so I'm going to ask him to come up and to, to welcome us to this place. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see everyone here. See ya, let's see ya. Ayatlak, Kwanaskwik, I Tenitin at Kumaskwim. Tlak, let's see when it's Kipalano, I Kultimoto, because he looks at the Quinoz, I Miknatin, Kushui, to E. This also works at Christmas Grim. Stay at Gwyneth Yuenis, set to something neat to swallow, if he looks taller, if he looks taller. I tap it with him, let's see it, see it's all. I want to say thank you. Thank you for St. John's College for having me here today to do a welcome to lead off our speakers series. It's, it's great, it's a great series, the Grant Ingram speaker series, and I want to raise my hands and welcome as our ancestors did in the past when they welcomed the first ship under the Spanish Captain Narvez and the first English ship under Captain George Vancouver. And I raise my hands to all of you here at St. John's College at UBC on the Musqueam campus here, and it's great to be a part of it. And I know our speaker is Duncan McHugh, and I always, always, always thought of him as another urban Indian fella. <laughs> uh, very much as uh, many of us here at Musqueam are so close to the city of Vancouver, we're, we're completely urbanized in, in, our, in our contemporary time. But I understand Duncan released a book last summer, and it's called The Shoe Boy, and it refers much about the trap lines that he was on. And lo and behold, here at Musqueam was one of the last trap lines that was, that was carried by our community right here in the Musqueam Territory. Our late aunt was one of the trappers here, and we got to go tag along with her as uh, pesky little boys. So it's uh, really, really something to understand that, that our author here has spent time on the trap line, and it's really, really interesting life, and it's, I know how tough it is, or how it can be, 
And that's uh, really great. So I want to say thank you again on behalf of the Hunt Kamenum speaking Muslim people. I tap was the up to say, collect quincy tea at all at the swallop of who eat on it, who eat tea. I tap. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Really appreciate that. Uh, it's interesting, I, I was up in the uh, UBC Okanagan campus, I think the first time that uh, Larry used the term UBC Musqueam campus, and so uh, it's nice to hear it again. Um, it sort of jars you for a second, it, and I think in, in a way that uh, I've appreciated over the years uh, Larry's doing so well, which is to kind of just make you think um, for a second, and so what did he mean by that? And so uh, hopefully you've you all caught the UBC Musqueam campus reference and it's made you think a little bit. Um, I'm so glad to have uh, you know the chance to welcome Duncan McHugh here. In fact Duncan uh, has lived here uh, several times before. Uh, we have some guest rooms here at St. John's and he's, he's done it as a, a guest. Uh, now he's a guest as, as the uh, Grant Ingram and the UBC Sustainability Reads um, uh, visitor. Um, the events, so this is a lunch event. Um, there's going to be a book reading tomorrow night at 5 p.m. next door over here as well. So for those who uh, didn't know about that, if you, you're still able to sign up, um, you know, there's still some room in our room next door. Uh, the partners in putting this all together, I want to acknowledge them, the First Nations House of Learning, uh, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, the Simon K. Y. Lee Global Lounge and Resource Center, uh, St. John's College, uh, the Center for Community Engaged Learning, UBC Sustainability Initiative, and the Irving K. Barber Learning Center. So it's a lot of partners uh, who came together to, to put this series of events together. Um, in particular, I want to uh, thank uh, the host committee that uh, really arranged a lot of these events. Uh, Sandra Shepard, who uh, just recently retired from St. John's as our operations manager and assistant principal. Deborah Martell from the House of Learning. Sarah Ling, who's one of our staff. Uh, Karen Selby from Sustainability Reads. Naomi Schatz and Yolanta Lekic, who's I think somewhere out there from Global Lounge. Um, right now, this event is uh, the R. Grant Ingram uh, lecture series. And uh, to, in order to talk a little bit about who Grant Ingram was, I wanted to invite up uh, Helen Burt, who was, uh, was, you're, are you still in the, in the VP research? Yes, you still are. I just wanted to make sure that I, I'm not uh, grandfathering her out. Um, Helen Burt, just want to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, good morning, afternoon, whichever it is, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. As Henry said, my name is Helen Burt. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research and Innovation at UBC. But um, I'm also, more importantly, a faculty fellow of St. John's College. Actually, I should probably fess up and say I'm a senior faculty fellow of St. John's College and have been for some time. And uh, my late husband was Grant Ingram. So um, I'm always thrilled to have a, an opportunity to just speak a little bit, um, provide you a little bit of context on why this is called the Grant Ingram Visiting Lectureship. So uh, Grant was born in England in 1945 to British parents, but when he was five years old, he and his parents emigrated to Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu in uh, a small town in rural Quebec near Montreal, where he grew up bilingual. He, um, skimming over periods of time, he did his undergraduate in physics at McGill, and his PhD in physical oceanography at MIT. He became a faculty member at uh, McGill University in the Department of Earth, of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. And he spent the vast majority of his academic career working in the Arctic and subarctic regions of Canada. And he, in so doing, developed very strong relationships, both personal and professional, with uh, the many Inuit and Cree communities in the uh, northern regions of Quebec. 
In the early 70s, in fact, he and several collaborators um, did research uh, as part of the environmental work that was going on in northern Quebec around the massive um, hydroelectric projects that were either being proposed or were underway. And he was also appointed by the then, in, I think it was in the early 70s, he was appointed by Jean Charest, who was the, at the time, the federal environmental minister, um, to be one of three experts commissioned to report on the environmental and social impacts of the, um, the $12 billion mega project on the Great Whale River. It was a massive hydroelectric project. And he then uh, came to UBC in 1997 and continued uh, to spearhead a lot of international efforts related to the Arctic and was duly recognized for those activities. He was named as the Canadian delegate to the International Arctic Science Panel in 2006. And in 2007, he was asked to review the Canadian contributions to IPY, the International Polar Year. So he did continue his research when he moved um, to UBC, um, but also engaged in some new collaborations, particularly on the cent Central Coast with the Helsinki Nation, and again involved in looking at the watershed and the coastal environment of the Central Coast. His life was unfortunately tragically cut short in 2007, but I think um, it's wonderful that his legacy lives on through events such as these. So I'd like to thank Henry for continuing the tradition and to all of you for coming today and also Duncan to, to you for, for being one of the, the, the lecturers in this series. So. Um, Thank you. I'm back to you, Henry. Thanks. Thank you, Helen. Um, it's I, I, being a principal here. I, I wanted to also acknowledge that uh, one of our former principals, uh, who also had a lot of interest in in the Arctic and in climate and geography, uh, uh, Olaf Slaymaker. So Olaf, you want to wave your hand? Uh, Olaf actually donated the flags. Being a geographer, I'm a historian, so uh, you know I think things change and, and flags come and go. But but geographers somehow want to uh, to acknowledge flags, and so it, it, that gift was one of his because he was a, also a principal of this college, um, uh, and so he's related as a faculty fellow still. Uh, but like um, like Grant Ingram before him, has devoted much of his time and energy to this uh, wonderful institution. Um, wanted to actually say a few more words about why you're eating. Um, one of the things that uh, Helen is, uh, is a gift uh, allowed us to do was to actually think of academia and academic conversation as something that often best takes place in an atmosphere where you're actually sharing food you know, dining. Our residents, they do it every day, at breakfast and at dinner, uh, in this space that you're occupying. And so we've had various uh, kind of experiments. We've done it over dinner, you know, where uh, last year Sally Otto, the geneticist at UBC, had a, you know, a wonderful talk about uh, genetic engineering and CRISPR and these, these technologies that are really changing our lives, even if you don't realize it. Um, before that, we've had, you know, um, Inu from the North come talk about the impact of climate change. Uh, we've had various people eat it, but we haven't had it over lunch. And so you're the guinea pigs, you know, uh, so you're, put your thinking caps on and uh, we're going to have a kind of uh, conversation up here on stage. And, and that's something that the Ingram lectureship we, we feel has become quite, uh, you know, known in a signature way for, which is, which is the format of, of dining, uh, sharing food and uh, listening and having great conversations. And so I wanted to actually um, also note that it's being video recorded and live streamed. So if there's a camera over there, you can see if, if you really don't want to be on, on camera, 
um, maybe just quietly shift over to some other spots where you're not in, in the way uh, and, and being caught on camera, but I need to let you know that, uh, that it is being recorded. Uh, they'll be archived on UBC Sustainability YouTube channel, and so you can watch it again and again with your friends. Um, if you want to. The event is also being audio recorded and will be aired on CITR, the UBC Students Radio Station, as part of the Unseated Airwaves show. Um, and I think that's really actually quite appropriate that it's being rebroadcast all over the place because of, of who Duncan McHugh is and, and those who don't know who he is because you've been living in a cave somewhere and uh, don't don't access any kind of media and uh, don't listen. Uh, well, you know, you can listen to him on CITR. Um, so, as I mentioned, there is the other event at 5 p.m. tomorrow um, that still has some space. Uh, if you need washrooms, this is really the pragmatic and practical. Uh, those who are watching live stream, you don't need to know this, but there's bathrooms and wa or washrooms over there and around this corner. Okay. Um, please turn off electronics um, so your cell phones don't go off. Um, and I'm going to actually now ask Karen Selby to actually formally introduce uh, our guests who are going to be up here. Karen? Thank you, Henry. Okay. Well, my name is Karen Selby. I'm with the UBC Sustainability Initiative. And as you know, this event holds two hats. It's uh, part of the Grant Ingram Speaker Series, but it's also a part of UBC Reads Sustainability. You might ask, well, what does Duncan McHugh and his book, The Shoe Boy, have to do with sustainability? And that's a fair question some of you might have. Um, but we can't talk about environmental and social well-being without also talking about indigenous perspectives and current issues. Um, there are issue, these are issues of sustainability, issues access to clean water, um, adequate housing, all of these things are really linked to our world's well-being. And I think if we are looking for the answers to many of these problems, we can actually look to communities, um, our indigenous communities in Canada. I believe if we lift up their voices, um, we can actually learn something. For example, Duncan speaks, and I hope I say this correctly, Duncan, I should have checked with you beforehand, um, of the Uchi Mao in northern Quebec. Um, when I read the book, I was so touched by, by the responsibility that the Uchi Mao hold. They are the trappers um, that are responsible for their own territory, and they keep track of all the hunting, all the families that are hunting on their land, so that they can make sure that each animal isn't overhunted. I think this is a beautiful example of sustainability and one that, that we could look to for help in figuring out how to continue to manage and live on this land. So now it's my pleasure to introduce two very special people to the stage. Uh, the first one is our moderator, Dr. Sandra Scott. She's a senior instructor here in the UBC's Faculty of Education. Before joining UBC, Sandra was a classroom teacher and marine educator. As a naturalist, scientist, and educator of, for, and in the environment, Sandra honors and embraces experiences that nurture our sense of wonder for the human and more than human world. She is an ardent protector, defender, and advocate for the southern resident killer whales and our shared home, the Salish Sea. Granny J2, Orca clan matriarch and knowledge keeper, has been her mentor and guide, and Sandra will be moderating our discussion with Duncan today. Now Duncan, Duncan McHugh is Anishinaabe, a member of the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation in Southern Ontario and a proud father of two children. He is the host of CBC Radio One Cross Country Checkup and was a reporter for CBC News in Vancouver for over 15 years. He's now based in Toronto um, and his news and current affairs pieces continue to be featured on CBC's flagship news show, The National. You may recognize him. Uh, Duncan was part of a CBC Aboriginal investigation into missing and murdered Indigenous women that won numerous honours, including the Hillman Award for Investigative Journalism. He was awarded a Knight Fellowship at Stanford University in 2011, where he created an online guide for journalists called Reporting in Indigenous Communities. He spent years teaching at the UBC's Graduate School of Journalism, actually, and was recognized by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association with an Innovation Award for Developing Curriculum on Indigenous Issues. He's also an author. 
His book, The Shoe Boy, a trapline memoir, recounts a season he spent in a hunting camp with a Cree family in northern Quebec as a teenager. And these books will be for sale, and he'll be doing a signing afterwards. So now please join me in welcoming Sandra and Duncan to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> this is so exciting for me, and I wanted to thank UBC Sustainability uh, for inviting me. You know, Duncan, my friends, when they found out that I would be moderating this and the, the, the title of your book, A Trapline Memoir, they went, are you sure you're the right person for that, Sandra? Because I, um, being an urban gal, you know, I'm not a, I haven't been hunting. And of course, I, in my environmental education classes, we talk about it, but I'm not a, an advocate. But I loved your book. And I, I connected with your people. Um, they were like, I was thinking of them as my relatives. And their experiences were so powerful. So thank you. For writing you, you're not the only one that's, that's, that's thinking about being on the stage. I'm, I'm sitting here having to answer questions as I opposed know. to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me questions. Okay, that, good, that's fine. Good, good. Um, but I just wanted to thank you for the book. I, I read it multiple times and I definitely will recommend it to my students. Graduate students who are interested in um, indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing. And uh, my pre-service teachers who are now going to be working with First Peoples Principles in their curriculum, and um, my friends and family. Miigwech, miigwech, yes. thank yeah. you. So my first question actually is about um, your experiences writing this, because the story, you wrote, first wrote the story as part of a creative, creative writing class at Stanford University. And uh, I'd like you to share with us uh, what initially, um, why you wanted, what were the experiences that prompted that, you to choose that story? And then that in-between time, and then share it with us again today for the wider audience in your book, uh, The Shoe Boy. I, I would love to do that. Before I do though, okay. I, I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, that we are here on the unceded Musqueam territory. I want to acknowledge uh, the tireless work of, of Larry Grant, uh, who is always at these gatherings to remind us that we're walking on Musqueam territory, and, and he is always such an advocate for his people, and, and so I thank uh, Elder Larry Grant for being here today. And also, I'm, I'm so honoured to be attached to a conversation that honours uh, Grant Ingram and the, and the work that he's done, uh, and, and working on, on particular the Great Whale, which I think we'll have a chance to talk about a little bit. Um, and everyone, enjoy your food because uh, I, w I also want to thank the people that cooked all this wonderful food. Um, it, it is. Yeah. Um, Henry said that that uh, this is an experiment, eating it over lunch. I think it's a wonderful experiment. I mean, what a wonderful way to share ideas, to talk about it while we're while we're mm -hmm. breaking bread. It's it's very it's a very very old concept. Um, you asked me what what started it. Yeah, the, those ex those experiences. If if I could, for for folks here, if you remember nothing else from 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 this luncheon, uh, think about this for me, please, because this is what started the shoe boy for me. Um, I was walking on the Stanford campus, and uh, so I was there to take a, a, a journalism fellowship. I spent a year at at uh, at Stanford, and and had a wonderful opportunity to become a student again. Uh, I was auditing classes, which was even better. I didn't have to worry about the marks. Um, so I took a creative uh, writing workshop, which I had never done before. I've been a journalist for 20 years now, and I've never, I've never taken any kind of writing course. Um, and so I was looking for things to write about. And I saw on, the, uh, on, on one of the campus billboards uh, a contest to write about a teacher who had influenced you in your life. So, so the thing I would like you to think about right now, all of you, is to think about who the teacher is that most influenced you in your life. 
And just think about that for a second. When I thought about it, I think the th thing that goes through what they were looking for were, were descriptors of good professors at, St at Stanford. Um, when I thought about it, you immediately kind of think of primary school teachers uh, or secondary school teachers, or if you're very, very lucky, you have a great uh, university professor perhaps who's, who's influenced you in your life. But the answer for me ended up being uh, Robbie Matthews Sr. And, and that's what I wrote about in my creative writing class, and that's how the shoe boy started. It started out as a two-page two description of why this Cree man, this elderly Cree fellow, a, a trapper from James Bay who had grown up on the land, uh, why he became one of the most influential teachers in my life. And, and it started, uh, when I wrote that first piece, it was the, what ended up being the second scene in, in The Shoe Boy. And I'll describe it for those of you who haven't read. Um, I spent five months on the trap line, as, as Karen said in the introduction, uh, with a Cree family. And uh, we were out in the bush. We, we didn't come into contact with We had two supply planes that dropped off food for us, and we lived off the land. We lived off what we were hunting. Uh, it was a very, very old lifestyle that Robbie was keeping going. And I was there to learn. The second scene in the book is a portage that we were on. And I had a laundry bucket, a metal laundry bucket. We were, we were going back and forth and back and forth, moving uh, items from our, from our freighter canoe uh, from, from one lake to another lake. And I had this huge metal galvanized laundry bucket that I was carrying like this stomping along and I was tired it was it was about October and the snow falls in James Bay uh, in October so it was getting cold and I was sweating and I was excuse the language I was pissed off <laughs> <laughs> I was tired we hadn't eaten for uh, two days um, I was hungry and there was a rope that kept getting caught on the trees and I was struggling and the old man, I call him old man because it's a term of respect uh, amongst the Cree, Cheyu. Uh, the old man passed me. He was carrying his load and he passed me and then he walked. So he passed me once and I'm struggling along and cursing and swearing. Comes back to get another load and then he passed me again. <laughs> and I was standing there and I thought, my God, he's lapping me. The old man is lapping me. Like, the, like what? this is embarrassing. And so I stopped and I dropped the laundry tub and I, and I, um, and I, and I thought to myself, you know, this is, this, is, this is just truly embarrassing. And he came, came back the second time. This is the fourth time he's passed me now. Um, he came back and looked at me and he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. This time he had, two, he had uh, rifles on his shoulder. So he put the rifles down against a tree and he went up to the laundry bucket and he grabbed that rope that was catch, catching on the trees and everything like that. And I had been carrying it like this. And he bent down, picked up the rope, and put the rope over his forehead, and then the laundry tub on his back. So the rope was a tump line, for those of you who have canoed or por uh, done any portaging. So he used his forehead and his neck to, and his back to carry the laundry tub on his back. Then he picked up the four rifles that he had, put them on his shoulder, <laughs> And then he proceeded up the hill, leaving me standing in the middle of the portage by myself. Didn't say anything to me. And, and so that, was, that ended up being the, the short scene that I wrote in my creative writing class. And I tried to unpack why, what that was all about, what, what he was doing, and, and why I was upset about, about not being able to carry this laundry tub and, and what he had taught me. And so that, and it turned into a book. And it's interesting because you say he didn't really, he never admonished you or, or got mad at you and he didn't really do direct teaching. But here is the greatest teacher for you, is someone who lived with you and was a mentor in that way. Yes. And so, so a couple things you need to know to understand this. Um, I'm a Anishinaabe, uh, Ojibwe from, from Southern Ontario. I grew up in Southern Ontario. Uh, about an hour uh, east of Toronto. 
And uh, I'm also a uh, half-breed, uh, is the, the term that they used back in the day. It's not, uh, fr it's fr frowned upon now, but uh, uh, my mom is white and, and my dad is Ojibwe. So, uh, and we moved to James Bay when I, was, when I was a teenager, so I was about 11 years old. So we were living amongst the Cree, uh, who, uh, very different tribe or First Nation, uh, where, and living in the north where their traditional lifestyle was, was still very much intact. Cree is the first language that, that most people speak in the communities. Uh, kids, when they go to school, often don't speak either English or French. Uh, when they go in kindergarten, they, they speak Cree as their first language. Um, and so this, I, came, I, I was, as Larry said, uh, very much an urban Indian mm -hmm. uh, who moved to the north uh, and, and was in this very traditional setting. Um, and for me, being out on the trap line was very much about a learning experience. It was something I liked going out hunting. I loved going out hunting, but I had never shot a gun before I moved to James Bay. Um, and it was my father uh, who conspired uh, with Robbie uh, Matthews to, to take me out on the land uh, after I had graduated from high school. So it was a gap year, essentially, for mm -hmm. me. So I was there very much to learn. But it wasn't a school setting of any of any type, um, and and there was no there was no formal. Uh, you know, Robbie and I didn't sit down at the beginning of the trip, and uh, and discuss learning outcomes, <laughs> uh, uh, or or uh, you know what the uh, uh, set out a syllabus of any kind. Um, in fact, it was it was very much up to me mm -hmm. to to take what I would be taking away from it. And if we were to ask Robbie, who would his great teacher be? I think he would, he would have an easy answer to that. His father, mm -hmm. his grandfather, his great-grandfather, his great-great-grandfather, mm -hmm. his great-great-great-grandfather. <laughs> um, you know, he, he was intimately and daily connected to those men um, and would, would tell stories of those men daily. Um, he would also say that Sally, his wife, mm -hmm. was his teacher. Um, Sally was very much, uh, he was, he, Robbie and Sally uh, made it quite clear uh, to me that when we were in the camp that Sally was the boss. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and he very much uh, saw her as, as being a teacher to him. Um, and so I think those were his teachers. Mm -hmm. And non-human teachers for him? Very much so. Very much so. It's, that's a, that's a, a, a great question. Um, one of the things that I... I'll tell you a little bit more about Robbie. Um, Robbie was, as, as Karen mentioned, uh, an Uchima. In, and in the Cree uh, language, I think when the, when the, <clears throat> when the first uh, missionaries and, and Hudson's Bay folk came to, to James Bay, uh, they were... They quite clearly, in, in, the, in the early journals of the settlers, uh, acknowledged that the Cree very much had a, a land system, uh, a, a, a system of, of operating and understanding where different families uh, would work the land. And so although they came to, to, to the Hudson's Bay Post to trade their furs, they always returned back to their, their territories. And these were all family territories. Um, I hesitate to call it a land tenure system because tenure is very much something, this, kind of, this goes to my law school training, but tenure is very much a, a, a system that, that harkens back to, to uh, British common law. Um, but the Cree definitely had a system uh, of, of understanding uh, use of land and particular territorial rights. Um, and, and so Robbie was an Uchima for a, a, a vast territory. Uh, we would travel for days uh, in our freighter canoe, and, and I never saw the full extension of, of his territory. It was, it was a vast hunting territory that he was responsible for. And uh, he had, ever since he was a boy, uh, been going out to that territory, and, and as Uchima had been charged to care for it. He was intimately uh, familiar, and still is, uh, with all of the animals in that territory. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and he, so your question goes back, did he learn from the animals? Very much so. He was incredibly observant of, of not only the, the, the weather patterns, uh, but, but the, the animal patterns as well. And, and had a connection to the animals that over the five months that I was with him, I only began to scratch the surface of, uh, in terms of my understanding. Um, but it was very much an, an intimate connection. Uh, it was a connection that visited him uh, in dreams. Mm -hmm. It was a connection that visited him. I think I don't think Robbie would call it ceremony. I, I would call it ceremony. Uh, in the but in the way that he approached uh, his the act of hunting, mm -hmm. I think for urban people in particular, uh, it can be very difficult to to understand hunting, to understand killing animals. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that it's, it's something that, that we're so disconnected to in the city um, that the, the concept of shooting animals uh, can be difficult to understand. For Robbie, though, it was very much, uh, and for all Cree hunters, uh, there's an understanding that to be a good hunter, um, there's an old joke, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what what does uh, what does a Cree call a, a vegetarian? What's what's the Cree word for vegetarian? Bad hunter. <laughs> uh, for, for for Robbie, uh, you know, if if you did, and other Cree hunters, if you don't pay the proper respects uh, to the animals, if uh, the, you're you're very much part of the circle. It's not a hierarchy uh, in in their cosmology. Uh, the animals are very much part of the circle. And if you don't pay your respects and act in a respectful manner on the land, uh, then the animals won't come to you. Uh, and they are, through trial and error over a long, long period of time, are very aware of what happens when the animals don't come to you. And so they are very, very aware of, of being connected to those animals and paying their respects to them in the proper way so that the animals do bless your family. A very powerful part of the book for me was when the bear came into the camp um, into the, and, and it was shot. And I, had, I struggled with that, um, but I, I, it was very enlightening to hear how Robbie and all of you interpreted that visit as a gift. And then Robbie's behavior, the way he, he was very quiet and he was singing um, and, and you wrote so beautifully about that, and I interpreted it, because you didn't tell us. Well, but my interpretation was that he was, he was singing to the bear in the, in the canoe on the way home. Mm -hmm. So that was a very powerful part mm -hmm. for me, and really got me to understand that connection to the bear, mm -hmm. and why the bear was hunted. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, for those who haven't re read the book, it was quite, it was, uh, it was quite a day. We, we were at the camp. Uh, and, and so l let me tell you a little bit about life in the camp. We were there, uh, the, the Cree have, have always uh, um, maintained a, a very, hunting is a, is a very critical part of their lifestyle. Um, the impact of the James Bay Agreement uh, and the hydroelectric project had a huge impact on, on the Cree and their ability to continue to, to be hunters. As part of the James Bay Agreement, uh, the, the Cree wanted to ensure that their people had the opportunity, the financial opportunity, to continue to hunt if that's what they wanted to do. And so there's something called the, the Cree, uh, it, it's a trapper's fund essentially, which is a guaranteed income for families that continue to live on the land. And so for every man, woman and child that is out in the bush, you get about 50 or $60 a day essentially. Uh, to supplement the income that you would gather from from furs, um, so we were out as uh, as as uh, Robbie was certainly there to to hunt and trap. So we were uh, trapping beaver, uh, otter, muskrat. Those those were the three uh, kind of uh, primary furs that we were we were hunting. Um, but we were also feeding ourselves. So uh, on a daily basis, a lot of small game actually, uh, rabbits, ptarmigan, grouse, uh, and then occasionally, occasionally, very occasionally, uh, larger game. Uh, there were caribou that, that came past our place. And then one day, one day as we were sitting around, uh, not doing much of anything in the camp, uh, a bear walked by. 
Uh, just out of the blue. It was in uh, late October, early November, which was quite late for a bear to be out. Uh, usually, typically at that point, uh, they would be, be starting to head into hibernation. And uh, it caught all of us off guard, uh, all of us uh, by surprise. I won't tell you how, what, what, how it ended up uh, getting shot, but um, it was very much for Robbie. It was, it was very interesting. When we, when we brought the bear back and skinned the bear, um, I don't know how, if any of you have, have seen an unskinned bear before, uh, but it's, it's eerily, eerily human-like. Um, they're, they're incredibly large animals. And when they stand tall, they're, they're, they, this, was a, this was a black bear. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, even a grizzly. Uh, but a black bear even, which is small by bear standards, stands about the same size as a man. Uh, and, and when they don't have the bulk of their fat and, and fur on them, they, they, they look an awful lot like a human being. Which is, which is why uh, one of the reasons the Cree and, and so many other indigenous uh, peoples as well have, have, have long honored the bear uh, as, as being our brother. Um, and, and so for him, uh, for Robbie, it was very much about him having this connection with the bear and, and that the bear gave himself to, to Rob. Robbie was the one that shot it mm -hmm. and, and, and that the bear had given himself to, to Robbie. I was thinking about your experiences, and, and maybe you could just tell us the, the actual writing of the short story and then the book. How did those con reconnect you or connect you to the land? Reconnect me to the land. Um, so I wrote the book uh, about five years ago now. Uh, so I was in my early 40s at the time. And it's a book about me as a 17-year-old. The good news is, <laughs> the good news is, uh, those things that you that you experienced as a teenager, um, they're still there. <laughs> even 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 when as we get older and and it seems like they've faded away into into the mists of time, they are they are all there. Uh, as as a writer, it was it was a challenging exercise for me though, uh, because it was very much a search search and rescue mission. <laughs> um, I went back to try to find my journals uh, of that time. And I did actually find them, and there was nothing. I wrote absolutely nothing during five, min five months on the trap line while I was there, which astonished me. I couldn't figure out what happened. I did, in retrospect, try to figure out, I think I wrote it all to my girlfriend and mm -hmm. sent it out mm -hmm. to let as, as letters uh, to her. So I did ask her, do you still have those letters? Um, but for me, it was very much a 40-year-old man sitting down and trying to remember what life was like as a 17-year-old. Um, and what I, what I discovered was in the, in the sitting down and the act of writing that many, many of these uh, memories started to, to come back to me. And so I, I would think about uh, the taste of a blueberry, for example. Um, and it would bring back, as I started to write about what a blueberry tastes like, it would bring back memories of being out and for two weeks every day out going out and picking blueberries. And when you go out to Richmond to pick blueberries at a U pick, it's pretty easy. <laughs> you just kind of, they're big and fat. And, but northern berries are, grow on the ground, and they're hardy and, and, uh, and small. And so it's hard work picking berries. And it was cold at that point, October, uh, and the rains were, were setting in. And all of us, Robbie and Sally and Bruce and Adrian and Randy, we went out every day for two, three weeks and gathered berries. Um, and so these memories started to come back to me, um, and and they were rich memories, uh, which which was was lovely that they were still in there, buried in there, that I hadn't thought about them for so long. You asked, did it connect me to the land again? Absolutely, it did, because I began to think. On the one hand, I don't live in James Bay anymore. I haven't lived there for for over two decades, but I would often, when I lived at Musqueam. Uh, take my son out and take my daughter out to go out into the back where the, the farmers used to live and pick blackberries, as many of the Musqueam people do, uh, to go out to pick blackberries and to go out and, and to learn about the plants there. And I realized that, that many of the things that I, uh, that I had learned while I was up in, in 
uh, in the north in James Bay were had become important values in my life here in in, in Vancouver. Uh, so it did it did reconnect me to the land in that way, although it was a very very different land setting. Yes, and that synesthetic response of you know you think back to how everything smelled and tasted and felt is very powerful. Um, you also write about. Uh, your identity as a teenager and not only did you go through the regular teenage um, issues but you talked about the duality not being native enough feeling useless um, and then you mentioned that really the outdoors became really the place you did feel at home so if you could just tell us a little bit more about how the outdoors became a healing place for you I was a geek. <laughs> um, I, I was a nerd and a geek and, and, and kind of very bookish as a, as a teenager. Uh, on, an, on an Indian reserve, that, that, can, that can put you on the outside sometimes. Uh, so, so I felt that way when I, when I was, uh, when I was um, in my First Nations community. Uh, and then on the other hand, when I, I I went I was I ended up being educated at a at a private school in southern mm -hmm. Ontario, uh, where I felt very much uh, like the indigenous kid that went home for for goose break went hunting for goose break uh, in 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 the in September and and in in March or uh, April sorry, and and so I I felt a little bit as an outsider there as well. Um, a foot in both worlds, which is which is kind of the the stereotype uh, that that's often used uh, about to to explain how indigenous people in contemporary society are are kind of operating with with a an eye to the past and 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 and, and operating within the present as well. But but I did very much feel like I was I, I had a duality. There were there were two, and as a teenager, as you mentioned, all teenagers are trying to 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 cope and deal with with who they are in 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 the world. To add on that layer of of trying to explore my indigenous identity, mm -hmm. uh, my Ojibwe identity, it was very it was very confusing to me as as a teenager, um, and and so. I didn't know it at the time. As I said, the learning outcomes uh, weren't discussed at the beginning of my trip to the to the trap line, but it was very much about me trying to find my place, find my voice uh, as as a as a young indigenous teenager, and that's not. I mean, I don't. That's something that that a lot of indigenous teenagers uh, find themselves struggling with now. We're we're so flooded. Uh, and I say we collectively, all of us, we're, we're so flooded by the internet and, and pop media. Uh, it can be very difficult uh, when you're a teenager living in the north, uh, whether you're a teenager living here, uh, a Musqueam teenager. Uh, it can be very difficult when you see images from around the world every day popping up on your phone when Hollywood and comic books and, and all, all kinds of imagery uh, that, that comes from another place uh, is is saturating the stories that you're told. It can be very difficult to formulate your own identity uh, and and your own your own history uh, as an indigenous person if you're not seeing yourself reflected in those stories that are being told in pop media and on your cell phone. So, what was the motivation for sharing your experiences through the writing, the written word? <clears throat> Um, the, the stories, the, the, I, we all have our we all have our foundation myth. Every, you know, all of us have we have a story that we tell people when when we're at cocktail parties or about where we come from and and who we are. And and my trip to James Bay was very much part of of my kind of foundation story that I had shared in little small ways uh, with people. That there was a point in my t in my life where I had gone off and and, and done this thing, gone out hunting. The mighty hunter, and and, and it sounds kind of cool in a cocktail party, you know. Yeah, we went went out and hunting beaver, um, but what I had never really done was was try to sit down and figure out what it had meant to my life now as an adult, mm -hmm. and and I thought that it was it was such a form it, in my mind it was such a formative learning experience that I felt like it was important to try to interpret what it was, 
what it, what it had taught me and how it had helped me be who I am today. And so, yes, when you, you raise that, that, uh, that challenge that I dealt with as a teenager of being uh, confused mm -hmm. about my indigenous identity, I'm not now. I'm, I'm very, very proud, very, very proud uh, to be Anishinaabe. Um, I'm also proud of being Scottish and German. Uh, that's part of who I am as well. In fact, uh, my mother just got me the McLennan family tartan, and I'm 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 planning to wear a, a kilt soon. So I'm lear uh, that that that's that's an I'm learning about the McLennan side of my family as well. <laughs> but I'm but I'm much more I'm I'm proud of who I am as an Indigenous person. I'm very blessed to have traveled across this country and learned from Indigenous people all over the place in my work uh, with CBC, and and so. Um, it's, it's been uh, the act of writing and sitting down to write that book helped me understand who I am today by looking back to a little bit of my past. And you talk about suicide and you talk about how you, you had those thoughts, um, the feeling of being useless and also the importance of the connection to the land for young indigenous people because it really is a healing place. Um, and that's something I think we can incorporate in, more into our, I'm thinking as a teacher always, how do we incorporate those, those indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing on the land? So the, when, I, when the, the, the scene came up uh, where I contemplated suicide, that was the first time that I had ever told anybody uh, was writing in the book. I I had never told anybody that ever. I didn't tell my my parents. Uh I didn't tell any of my lovers. I, did, I no one no one I'd never shared that with anybody. Um and and it was a surprise to me when it popped up uh in in this search and rescue mission that I was on to remember that and to recall it viscerally uh that I was that close. Uh, at one point, I was out on a hunting hunting trip one day by myself, um, and uh, I was determined to bring home a beaver on my own and to kind of prove my worth as a hunter. Uh, and so I stalked out, uh, I staked out a beaver that we had had our eye on for for quite a while. Uh, I was at a pond about it was about a four or five hour hike away from our camp. And I sat and I waited 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 and I waited. It was cold. And then finally that little beaver came out in the pond and started to swim across the pond. And so I said, okay, this is my moment. And I so I raised my 22, took a deep breath, and I took a shot. And I missed by a mile. <laughs> like, like I missed by a mile. You know, and you only have one shot with a beaver. When they're swimming across, when you're swimming, you have to, you have to shoot them in the head. Uh, and then if you miss, that's it. Uh, they, they, so the beaver slapped his tail, bang, that was it. And then they go back into the lodge and they won't come, they won't come out for another couple of days. They'll, they'll stay in the lodge there for a couple of days and they certainly won't stick their heads back up in the water. So I knew, I knew, so I had one shot and I missed. Uh, and on my hike back, um, I, I came across a crest of land, and uh, and and I and I seriously considered killing myself. Um, and when I <laughs> when I what was particularly challenging for me to to write about that and to share it with others was the fact that I have been on the national news for 20 years now and done more stories than I want to share with you about communities that have had suicide crisis. And I have stood up in front of cameras, national cameras, and said, here's another First Nation community where children are killing themselves and the people are asking for help. And so that made the experience that I had had personally even more challenging to, to, to deal with, the fact that I have been reporting on this issue for over two decades now. There are lots of people who have studied this much more than I have. 
and who are very much more knowledgeable than I have. But I do think that we know a few things about indigenous suicides and the and the the gross overrepresentation that we have in this country in Canada. Indigenous youth are uh, commit suicide four to five to six times higher than the rest of the Canadian population. The Inuit population and Inuit youth are killing themselves at 10 to 12 times higher than the rest of the population. Why is this happening and what are the solutions? These are things that I've a lot of people have spent a lot of time talking about. I do think that we know that indigenous communities that have connections to their traditions, mm -hmm. that have uh, some empowerment with regard to their governance, which have, um, which have proper systems of... Uh, they have fire departments, they have police departments, they have control of their school systems. In those communities, there's far less suicide. We know that. But we particularly know that communities where the language is still intact, where the culture is still intact, there are far, the, the rates of suicide are far lower. Which is why I think that it's so important that the kind of experience that I had going out on the land and reconnecting with traditions and learning traditions that I didn't even know is something that's so valuable for Indigenous youth now. It may, in James Bay, it may mean going out on the land on Iu Itchi and learning how to hunt and trap beaver, uh, or learning how to make snowshoes. Uh, here on the West Coast, it may mean reconnecting with the, the canoe tradition. It may mean going out and learning the proper respect that it needs to be carried when you have a paddle. And when you're out on the ocean, the, the, the ceremony, the prayers that go along with being a, a good paddler in a big canoe. These are the kinds of things that connect our youth to our communities and our past and our, and our history in a way that give them the self-esteem that they need so that they don't end up contemplating suicide uh, in, in, in the contemporary day. And right now we're experiencing off the coast of Bella Bella uh, a barge, a diesel barge that has gone aground. It's been towed past that area, but the threat to Goose Island would have wiped out that entire community. There is a call for indigenous uh, stewards uh, on our coasts, people who can protect, defend, uh, drawing upon their traditional um, cultural knowledge. And I think that's really exciting. If we can talk about that and, and have that in place, what are your thoughts on, on having indigenous stewards as protectors of the land? Um, I think it's important, uh, two things. I mean, stewards is a beautiful word. Mm -hmm. the, the, some of the, the writing that, uh, there's, there's a, Boyce Richardson is a, is a well-known author and journalist who has written about the Cree quite a bit. And he uses the term uh, garden to, to describe the Uchimal and their connection to the land that they work. It's, a, it's an interesting word to use uh, to think of a hunter treating the land like a garden. Uh, I think it's an attempt to try to communicate to the Western mind how a hunter uh, interacts with the land, even though hunting is very not, uh, not very like farming at all. But, but, but to think of, of the land as a garden, something that you, that you have to nurture, uh, is, is an important concept of stewardship. And I think that, that people here on the coast, for example, who go and collect seaweed and, and who, you know, you often hear, you, you hear uh, just over in Tsleil-Waututh, they will often talk about uh, that the, uh, the ocean is, is the setting of the table um, and, and that that's our grocery store uh, out there. Uh, you'll you'll hear so so ocean people have the same kind of notions of stewardship. Um, I do also think though that it's important uh, that we acknowledge that that First Nations also have uh, contemporary needs to feed their families as well, and that these are that these are very much in 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 self determining communities. It's very very important that the community is involved in the discussion about how they will interact with the land. 
And so some communities will decide that, uh, that pipelines, uh, that copper mines uh, are important aspects of living uh, as, as in, in the 21st century for their communities and that there are sustainable mm -hmm. and environmental ways to do such things. So I, I do think that it's important that we recognize that as important as environmental stewardship is to many, many First Nations, uh, there are also that, that the notion of self-determination also shouldn't limit First Nations to just being environmental stewards. So returning to Robbie, and of course we are talking about UBC Reed sustainability. If we were to ask Robbie to his understanding of sustainability, what do you think his response would be? I think um, I think Robbie Robbie would laugh at the term sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because because he lives it, <laughs> it's 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 part of it, it's part of of who, uh, it's part of his ethos to use a Greek term. Um, you know, to him to him I think a, a, a better term, and I wish I knew the word in Cree. I don't, uh, but a, but a better term might be respect, and I think that respect uh, for the land and for animals is is very much what what governs the way that the Cree, Cree approach the land. Um, and so sustainability for, for him uh, would mean, and I don't mean this to sound trite, but let me, let, me describe, let me describe something. I'll describe the walking out ceremony. So when the Cree, uh, when a baby is born uh, in, in traditional uh, society, uh, the baby won't touch the earth outside the midwap. The uh, midwap is a teepee. Uh, the baby won't touch the earth outside the midwap until they've had a walking out ceremony. And once they're able to walk, then uh, they get fancy regalia made for them. So they get nice little, nice little moccasins, and and they get little hunting mitts, and a beautiful little toque, and. Uh, everybody, they, they get all kinds of grandmas and the aunties all make all kinds of beautiful uh, regalia for them. And then they're, if, they're, uh, if it's a girl child, then they, uh, they carry uh, an axe um, and they carry a, it's like a, um, uh, they carry a wooden spoon and they carry a, a carving tool, uh, the, the, which is what the women, women use. Um, and then if it's a, if it's a boy, uh, they'll carry uh, a gun with them, a little tiny wooden gun that the, that the grandfathers and the grandmothers would have carved these things for them. And then they'll, they'll walk around uh, a pole. Uh, they, so everybody goes to the Mitchwap, the TP, all the extended family. So this is tens and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 people. And they all stand there and the, and the mother and the father uh, or the parents or the, the caregivers, they'll walk the little baby uh, toddler around the, the pole, uh, carrying their little their 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 hunting items. Uh, carry then they kind of teeter around, and then they bring they they go to the pole and they bring in a beaver, a little wooden beaver, or they bring in a little uh, uh, for a, a girl they they'll bring in a, a like a pot that's carved. And they bring that in to the grandmothers and the grandfathers who are sitting inside the midwap. And everybody makes wonderful noises. Oh, look what you brought me. And then they sit down and they have a huge feast. So that's how a Cree baby is welcomed into Cree society. And let me tell you why I told that story. The reason is because what it amply illustrates is, is how the Cree connect to the land, how important the land is for them as part of their society. What it means for them is that this new generation and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation are going to be connected to the land. Those gifts that the, that the little babies bring are all, they're not bringing uh, MacBook Airs. Yeah. Yeah. Right, uh, they're not they're 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 items that that are connected to the to the land, and and so there's an acknowledgement that those children are going to be carrying the gifts of the land forward 
to the, this generation to the next generation. And it's no accident that at a Cree walking out ceremony that the baby would end up presenting themselves and these gifts to their grandparents, to the, to the elders in, in the family. Because it's a connection for the youngest generation to the oldest generation which is also the most valuable, valued connection within Cree society, to have the youngest connected to the oldest. Without a history, we have no future. And, and so that is very much uh, the notion of sustainability amongst the Cree, that unless you protect the gifts that the land has given us, then our children won't have those opportunities to be able to carry on the tradition. Thank you. And Duncan, just before we close, thank you for your final piece in the book where you talk about, you weren't a great hunter of, of the more than human, but you became a, a wonderful hunter of stories. And I, that's, I said, that's what I do as a teacher. I go and I ask stories, I sing to the stories to come to me, then I share them. So that, we are all hunters, really. In, in a really wonderful way. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to our audience because we, I'm sure people have lots of questions for you. And what I'm going to do, because we don't have um, uh, microphones, I will repeat your question so everyone can hear it here. So is, who would like to be the first to ask a question? Yes. Compared to the way you grew up, and you said you had a foot in two worlds, how similar, different um, is it for your children? And what have you conveyed to them? Because it's a different world, really, that they're living in now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the question is, what, what have I conveyed to, to my children because it's a different world that they're living in now? Yes, yeah, so, so my children ended up growing up. Uh, I have a 21-year-old daughter, uh, Samantha, and, and uh, my, my son is 15, Chas. Uh, and my children grew up here in Vancouver, which was a very different lifestyle from the one that I grew up in in southern Ontario and very, very different from the one that I grew up in in James Bay. Um, I think w when you ask the question about, about uh, why I chose to write, it was about interpreting what the Cree had shared with me. And so as I said in, in toward the, the end of the book, when I had my first goose ceremony, so when I shot my first goose, there's also a ceremony for, for a boy and, and now girls who shoot their first, first geese. Uh, when I drank tea with Robbie Matthews when I was out on the land, uh, those things all became part of, of who I am, even though I haven't returned very often to James Bay. The West Coast, Vancouver, uh, has been very much the, ho the home and the place that, that, uh, that my, my former wife and I raised our, our children. Uh, she's she's Carrier uh, from Northern British Columbia, and I'm Ojibwe. And so we've tried to, to share those, those teachings with, with, our, with our children. But I'll give you an example. Um, you asked, they're in a very different world? Yes. But uh, both, my son hasn't shot a goose yet because he has, I haven't returned back to James Bay very often. But both my daughter and my son uh, had coming of age ceremonies when they were 13. Uh, with my daughter, uh, it was her godmother who was Ojibwe who uh, spent a year with her in a coming of age ceremony. With my son, uh, we realized that my Ojibwe family uh, in Ontario very much had a, had a large part in, in my, my daughter's coming of age ceremony, but we wanted to uh, also honor uh, my, my uh, wife's f family. And so we, I consulted elders here um, about how to run a coming of age ceremony in the setting that he had grown up here in Vancouver. And so what we ended up doing was uh, having a mixture of traditions. Uh, Dr. Lee Brown, who many people here at UBC would know, uh, shared his traditions from his, his Cherokee upbringing and the, the Shushwap learning that he had uh, done in the interior. Uh, Shane Point, who's a very respected uh, teacher 
uh, at Musqueam also very kindly uh, offered to be a part of, uh, to play a role in his coming of age ceremony. And so I think what we recognized was is that we had indigenous community here in urban Vancouver that was very connected and that was very much part of our children's uh, culture. And so it was important to recognize that as well. Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't have earbuds. Uh, we, uh, but, but poor, so, so for those of you who read the book, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll meet Bruce. Um, and, and Bruce was uh, a little bit older than me. He was probably about 20 or so. Uh, and Bruce brought an entire box, uh, a box this big, full of uh, those big, fat Duracell batteries. Because he was... We, we had no power, we, were, we, we, had no, we didn't even have a generator. Uh, we, we were heating, the, it was a one-room cabin that we were in, the, which we were living, uh, the stove was, was going constantly, the, the, the wood-burning stove. So it was, we are roughing it. Uh, Bruce made sure that he brought an entire box full of Duracell batteries because he was a music fanatic. Um, and had one, uh, uh, I'm dating myself, but a ghetto blaster, uh, which he would pop his eight, uh, you know, and, and he portioned out the, that battery use because he loved Steve Earle and Metallica and uh, Iron Maiden, and he was, he was a headbanger, he, Quiet Riot, uh, you know. Uh, so, yeah, the, we, we, in little portions, those were the sound, like, uh, you know, I was, Bruce had an incredible musical sophistication. He was a, a heavy metal aficionado, really. Um, and so I, 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 he would, he, over the five months, he managed to make those batteries stretch so that we got little, there were, there were also, there was the crackly sound of the CB radio. Um, you know, each hunter, uh, in this vast territory of, of James Bay has a, has a CB radio, which is very much the lifeline. Uh, it's there for safety reasons. If someone, if someone gets into trouble and, and needs to have a plane flown in, then they can get on the CB radio and call out. But Sally was always on the CB radio because she wanted to find out the bingo scores. She wanted to, fi she wanted to find out you know, whose babies were being born. She Bruce wanted to know if the Boston Bruins had won that night. You know, so, so I remember Sally talking in Cree endlessly on the CB radio. I, I, I raised those two points because you may want me to say that I, you know, I, that I, I remember the goose calling over as they flew over, but, but <laughs> which I do, right? I mean, I, I absolutely, and the, and the, the lapping of the lake at the late of the night, and, <laughs> uh, but, but those are very much also the sounds that I remember and the ones that connected us to community in a, in a, in a large way. We, even though we didn't see another human being other than an uh, airline pilot twice, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, we were very connected on a daily basis to, to life back home in, in, uh, in Chisassipi. We had a question over here. Can I ask people, how many people here uh, feel at peace when they go out on the land? When they, go out, when they go out and stand on Spanish banks, for example, when they go and look at the ocean? So I don't, I, you know, that's, it's really interesting that that, that that many people, I think that they're, even though we're very much urban folks, I mean, the very fact that you're here, we're, we're, all, we're all urbanized to a certain, certain degree. Um, one of the things that people often remark about when they come to UBC campus is, is the spectacular beauty of the, the nature on this campus. I compare that to York, where my daughter went, <laughs> which, is, which is a series of bunkers in, in northern, northern Toronto. Uh, you know, nature, nature is something that I think that, that we as human beings um, need to connect to. 
Um, unfortunately, m many urban planners lost sight of that in, in, in various stages of, of building many cities. And, and we're suffering the effects, I think, of cities that have been designed uh, to, to prevent us from connecting to nature. From my happy place, my happy place is sitting on a, a dock in the bay. Uh, that's, that's where I, and I, and I say that, uh, you know, with regards to Otis Redding for sure, but, but, but more, more as a metaphorical place. Uh, sitting on the dock on the bay is where I feel like my body, my body begins to get in tune with its own natural rhythms. And, and, and I can feel, and it's not just a fact, it's not a question of the fact that I'm a, a, a working professional and I don't have enough holidays. That's, that's not it. It, it's, it, it has to do, it has to do with, with getting back in touch with natural rhythms, which I think urban life, unfortunately, because of, of design, because of design, has taken us away from those natural rhythms. Do you have a favorite tea? Do I have a favorite, a favorite tea? Uh, just red rose, yeah. I know, we all love our red rose. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Other questions? So I host this show called Cross Country Checkup, which is a, a two-hour radio conversation. Uh, it, it is the old, one of the oldest shows, perhaps the most long-running show. It's older than I am. Uh, it's Cross Country Checkup. Um, and there was a, a discussion a couple of years back before I took over about perhaps taking Cross Country off the air. Why do we need to have two hours of, of phone conversation? In a, in a day and age when not many people are even using the phones anymore. <laughs> uh, when the idea was to open up the airwaves to Canadians for two hours because they had no voice back in the 1960s when the show started. Uh, now they have voice 24-7. Anybody who ha wants to have a voice can have a voice on their phone and Twitter and, and Facebook and everything. So why do we need to have this two-hour phone-in conversation? I am so glad that the CBC, not, not only for, for uh, obviously biased reasons, I'm so glad that the CBC continued the show. Because I think that the conversation that we have on Cross Country Checkup every, every Sunday uh, is a wonderful dialogue. And it's a meeting place where Canadians can certainly voice their opinions, but more importantly, listen to each other's opinions. And I have not once, not once on that program in, in a year and a half of hosting it, have I ever seen the conversation go off into a, a, a situation where I felt like I had to cut a caller off. Like, I, I do have that power. I can, I can we just pot down and I can, tur I can turn someone off. I signal my sound tech. I've never had to do that because my experience has been that in talking to each other, listening to each other with our actual voices, uh, that people are fairly civil and that they will have a conversation and a dialogue. And I feel like checkup, I, I, don't, I don't agree with everybody that phones into checkup and you may not agree with everybody that phones into checkup, but it is enlightening to hear people as they talk on the show. And hopefully we forward the conversation in a direction uh, that we can all continue to, to, to live and work together as neighbors. Online is a very different, very different space. It's a very different space. Um, and one of the problems with online is the anon anonymity that goes along with online. Uh, and we have seen uh, that that an anonymity 
encourages the worst uh, in people. And so I do think that as responsible journalists in particular, that it's not enough to just create an open space for people to say whatever they want in a, in a free market, uh, freewheeling internet. There is a place for curators. There is a place for responsible curators. And I, Facebook, I'm looking at you. Um, there is a place for people to ensure that the internet is a place where people can be safe. And so, in particular, with, with regard to CBC Indigenous, um, we decided that the conversation uh, online, on our stories at least, uh, was no longer a safe place. It was akin to a drive-by shooting. Uh, you could you could sit down and read the story, and you even if you didn't want to read the comments, you couldn't help but see the comments at the end of the story. And so we made better efforts at CBC Indigenous, at least, to to be more curated with regard to the types of comments that we were asking for, and making sure that there were journalists, not just bots, uh, that were actually curating the comments. Um, I'm, I'm all for people, you know, having having their their fair share, uh, speaking their voice, letting people know what what they think of my story. By all means, um, but I do think that anonymity is a problem, and I do think if you're going to share your opinion, then you you should uh, you should post your name to go alongside it. Thank you, Duncan. I think we've come to the end of our question and answer. I will say though, the bear grease works for the hair, doesn't it? <laughs> Duncan writes that bear grease keeps your hair dark, and it works. It's great. There's a little more. In <laughs> no. Um, I would like to remind people that uh, the book is wonderful, and we have copies available to purchase. And also tomorrow evening, Karn, we have the, the evening time with Duncan. Um, you'll be reading from your book, I understand, and there's still uh, spots available for that. So just wanted to remind everybody. And thank you so much. Thank you, Duncan. Um, Thank you. Loved it. Jimmy Glitch, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you all for coming. I know in the, uh, did you like the lunchtime timing of this? Yeah, it's yeah. like in the middle of the day. Okay, so, um, okay, it'll be a, a, a positive experiment. I want to thank both of you again for, for coming up in front of everyone. Now, I'm sure Duncan's used to it as, as, a, as a radio personality, although they don't, well, I guess on TV, on, on national, they show their, your face as well. But it, it is difficult to, to have actually a conversation, you know, spontaneous in front of a, a crowd. It's not a, a normal thing that we, we do. So we do appreciate you, you, you know, come, going along with our format and, and doing s such a wonderful job. Uh, we have a little um, gift, of, token of appreciation uh, which we give to uh, speakers which is a bowl uh, again it's uh, it's an indication to us of of coming sharing food uh, sharing a meal sharing conversation um, we thought for a while that it should be an iron sort of bowl like an iron rice bowl in China it means you can't break it you can always come and get food and line up uh, at, at our uh, uh, food services but but actually it is it is fragile because this this space uh, that you mentioned before of having a conversation that that is respectful and where people share ideas and listen and hear each other uh, is a, actually a fragile space and so the bowl is is a fragile but it's also a symbol in some sense of uh, your joining us today and being part of a conversation which we hope continues I mean for those there's still coffee so uh, if you heard things that you want to chat with others about and, and maybe even arrange an appointment later over coffee or over a meal to continue the conversation. We hope this is the start of a conversation and that uh, you've all you know, been welcomed here um, on this unceded territory on Musqueam by Elder Larry Grant and, and been able to hear, uh, Duncan, uh, your, your thoughts and, and, and hopefully those who, who haven't read the book or bought the book that they can, they can get more of it. But uh, thank you so much for sharing with us today, sharing your stories and sharing the wisdom that you've got from your teachers uh, with us. So uh, 
thank you and please accept this as a token of our appreciation and and you can bring it back and uh, you don't even have to show up with it at the line uh, you know, you're always welcome to, to to break bread and have a meal here with us thank you <laughs>